Hey everybody, welcome back to Young Engineers of Today. Hello Mateo. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Hannah. Um, you might want to send an email to Mr. or Mr. or Mrs. Dubik and just let them know, just in case. Um, but that's unfortunate, I'm sorry to hear that. But I hope you guys had a good couple of days otherwise, um, and I hope, Hannah, that uh, it's for fun stuff. <laughs> um, and I hope you're ready to continue with Arduino, because that's what we're going to do. Um, so we spent Monday trying to get everybody's physical Arduinos communicating with their computers. As I understand it, we should have gotten everybody more or less good to go. Now, what that means from here on out is for the next few classes, we're not going to have, I don't think we're going to have a whole lot more uh, Arduino classes left for us um, until we move on to something new. But what that means for the future is, and from now into the future, is if you're working on something, you are more than welcome to either work with a physical Arduino, like a SparkFun kit, or continue working on circuits.io like we have in the past. This is entirely down to personal preference. Uh, I can totally understand that working with an Arduino, like a physical Arduino, and like making a circuit and having it do the thing is pretty cool. Like, uh, that makes perfect sense. I can totally understand that. I can also understand from a debugging and fixing standpoint that working with circuits.io can be a lot easier, uh, a prototyping standpoint, certainly. And if you run into an issue with your circuit, Mike can much more easily help you guys out. Uh, but again, this all comes down to personal preference, whichever one you're more comfortable with. I'm not going to say, hey, you guys have to work with the physical Arduino, nor am I going to say, hey, you guys have to work with um, with uh, circuits.io. So that's all down to, hey, Cohen, uh, that's all down to what you prefer. So last Wednesday, we messed around with servos, like so. In fact, we had a servo that just sort of went back and forth. We just go ahead and start the simulation again. Watch as the servo goes to the left, back to the right, clockwise, counterclockwise. That's totally fine, Cohen. No worries. Um, no rush at all. But yeah, so this is what we were doing with the, with the servo. So as you can see, just like pretty much every other circuit we have, we have the 5 volt in the ground from the Arduino hooked up to the plus and minus rails respectively on the breadboard. Because remember, red for a lot of circuits means power, black means ground, um, so that's what we're utilizing. Now, we hooked up the power and the ground to their respective uh, spots on the servo. So the power is taking in 5 volts. The ground is sending out, not 5 volts, but a, an amount of power. And those are hooked up to the plus and minus rails on our breadboard. And then we have this third one. And the third one, if you mouse over it in uh, circuits.io, is labeled signal. Signal takes in does anybody remember what it takes in? Maybe something a little bit more specific than electricity. Thank you. I knew that was coming. Thank you, though, Brendan. <laughs> um, yes, it takes in the signal. It takes in a pulsed electrical, or, or timed electrical pulse. Excuse me, that's what I'm looking for, a timed electrical pulse. Based on the timing of that pulse, hey, no worries, Cohen. Um, based on the timing of that pulse, that tells the servo to rotate to a certain orientation. What makes a servo different from a regular motor? Does anyone remember that? Okay, it can be programmed to what though? To what end? What are we, what 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 what's 
It can change direction. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what can a motor do that a servo generally cannot do? Build speed. Yeah, more power and speed, definitely. Um, although you can have some very fast servos. How about this? What is this servo not doing? It's going back and forth, but what is it not doing? Yeah, spinning a whole circle. Yeah, there's that too, running smooth. But I think that has more to do with um, <laughs> the latency and the, the the screen capping software. But yeah, no, it's not it's not spinning a it's not spinning an entire circle. Servos generally do not go 360 degrees. Servos are generally limited to 180 degrees of movement. Expensive servos sometimes can even be limited to only 90 degrees of movement. But why would it be expensive if it could only move 90 degrees? I hear you asking. Maybe, you know, if you sound like um, Teddy from Bob's Burgers. Um, I don't know. I don't judge. Uh, but that's because a servo is told to orient itself in a specific direction based on that timed pulse. It sacrifices its ability to rotate 360 degrees, unless it's a very imprecise servo generally. Uh, it sacrifices its ability to rotate 360 degrees and continue rotating like that for an ability to go for the, like something programming it to go, okay, turn to 70 degrees and it'll go, okay, and it turns to 70 degrees and it stops. And that's the important thing, it stops. It stops at specific points that are useful to us. Um, <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, but, uh, you know, I try, I try. Um, that can be useful for a lot of things. What might a servo be used for? A servo, a servo can be used for door locks on a car, automatic door locks. Uh, a servo can be used for I'm trying to think of very, uh, although a lot of times do door locks are solenoids. Um, a servo can be used for a hinge. Yeah, a servo can be used for a hinge. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of some examples here. Of course, nothing's coming to mind because that's just how things work. Uh, if you think about um, like animatronics and like a, a robot like waving its arm, that would be a servo. A, uh, a mixer would probably be a regular motor. Five Nights at Freddy's. Oh boy. <laughs> um, because yeah, uh, a, a, a mixer would rotate 360 degrees. Um, let's see here. Uh... Hypnotism. Yeah, actually, you could have a um, like grandfather clocks. How they have those pendulum pendulums that's used to keep time. <coughs> you could actually have <coughs> maybe not all of them. Yeah, it's true. Although generally you want to have rapid motion with a mixer, rapid repetitive motion. So it, I think generally most mixers would have a regular motor in them, but it's possible, yeah. Um, but you could have like a grandfather clock. That's not like a real grandfather clock. I know, right? You are feeling very sleepy. Um, it could be running on like an atomic clock or something like that, so you'd never have to wind it up. But it could have like a fake pendulum that is timed with the movement of each second, which sounds, you know, more complicated than it needs to be, uh, but it's possible. And that would, that would use a servo that could use a servo to, to send the pendulum back and forth, whether or not you feel like that's worth, um, manufacturing, uh, that's, that's, that's personal preference, but 
a stopwatch that doesn't go all the way around a limited time. Yeah, so like if you're only like if you have like an egg timer or something like that, and it's meant to go from zero to like ninety seconds or something like that, you could you could use a servo for that. Um, there are many other ones. Uh, you can think of, yeah. I just, for some reason, they're all escaping me now because that's just how these things work naturally. They've got to. When you're trying to tell somebody about it, of course they're going to go away naturally just to make things, you know, not useful. Uh, anyway, that's servos. They do things that motors can't do and motors do things that servos can't do and they exist and they have a rightful place in our mechanical world, in our electronic world. Um, but yeah, so let's see here. We can we can tell it to you know just move back and forth like this and hypnotize you. However, we can do we can we can probably actually spend a little bit of time exerting more control over the orientation of the servo, and that's what we're interested in. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go back and I'm going to build a new circuit from scratch. Just in case you're working on this at home, you can get everything hooked up the same way. If you're working with one, two, three circuits, eh, you know, it may not be a, it's generally not the worst idea in the world to start over with a new circuit. So you have separate discrete circuits, but you can use the same one that you've already used before if you so prefer. It's not going to break the world if you don't. It's just going to be a little bit boring while I explain how to hook up a servo again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab another servo, another micro servo that is, and I'm going to grab another Arduino. Except, I'm going to grab a new, again, um, personal profits. If you want to use circuits.io, you're more than welcome to. If you want to use a physical Arduino, you're more than welcome to as well. Um, whatever your choice is, though, um, just keep in mind, uh, an Arduino might be a little bit more fun to work with, but it's going to be harder for me to help you um, debug it in case something goes wrong. That's the only that's the, that's the downside to it, because uh, like if it's got if it's got a physical issue like a wiring issue, I'm not going to be able to 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 help you out with it nearly as easily as if it were circuits.io. But uh, also it's, it's also kind of dependent upon you having the the proper uh, components and everything like that. But if you have all the components, if you feel confident with how you're wiring it up or you know debugging the wiring, um, feel free to, because it's always fun. Just to have a, a physical servo going like on your desk. Anyway, we've got a circuit, we've got a servo. We're going to add another thing though, potentiometer. Who here remembers what potentiometers are? Oh, you don't have the servo? Okay, well you might have to do circuits.io then. Unfortunately. But yeah, who here remembers what a potentiometer is? Hmm, well, what about this? Oh, you do? Okay, what is it then? Oh, okay. Uh, a potentiometer has a knob on it. What does that knob change? Maybe that'll help jog your memory. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's eventually what we're going to do. Um, but what change? What does the potentiometer change? Like, what changes on the potentiometer when you turn the knob? Mm, I'm thinking electronically, electrically, I should say. Electrically, what changes within the servo? Or excuse me, um, the the potentiometer. Not quite. Uh, there's no speed that changes in the potentiometer. 
what are uh, okay I'll just go over it again a potentiometer is a variable resistor as you turn the knob the resistance increases or decreases depending upon the direction that you turn the knob counterclockwise the resistance decreases clockwise the resistance increases so as you increase the resistance on the resistor you're going to get a smaller value sent out to the Arduino because it's going to increase the resistance thus you're going to get a smaller amount of voltage which means a smaller number is going to be read by the Arduino so that's the end result of everything um, the, the uh, a potentiometer affects uh, voltage by increasing resistance across it so let's go ahead and let's set up a little circuit here. So I'm gonna move this over. Okay. So I've got I've got my uh, I've got my Arduino hooked up, or, uh, sitting over here to the right of the breadboard. And the reason I have it sitting over here is because I'm gonna hook up my power and my ground to the plus and the minus rails, just like we always do. Uh, actually, let's let's move it up here. And we'll make it a red wire because we want to make it oops. Want to make it a live wire, right? It's going to be it's going to be uh it's going to have some power going through it. So we make it red so we know that there's power going through it. Now I'll hook up my ground to the minus. We're going to make that one a black wire because that's the grounding wire. So, so far pretty simple, right? We got power and we got ground. Now, now we need to hook up our servo. And we're just going to hook this up the same way we did before, by bringing in power and ground and signal to it. So let me rotate the servo by hitting R. So it's like that. And we're just going to one-to-one -one hook it up. So ground, plug directly into the minus rail, make it a black wire. Power hook directly up to the plus rail, make it a red wire. That leaves the signal wire. Now we need to send a signal out to the, um, the servo. What I'm going to do is I am going to hook uh, the signal up to pin three. And we're going to make this purple because it's nice and visible. <clears throat> why not? So why pin three, you might ask. Well, <coughs> notice how, excuse me, how pin three has this little tilde next to it. Notice how this little tilde is also next to the three letters PWM. Now, I've explained what PWM is to you guys before, but it's been a while, so I feel like we could probably use a refresher. Does anybody remember the term pulse width modulation? Note takers, that's fine. Um, okay, <clears throat> what are the two types of electrical circuits? Uh, we've got one that starts with an A and one that starts with a D. Or two types of electrical signals, excuse me. Mm 
I'll give you a hint, they're on my screen right now. Hmm. Good. Okay. That's true. Um, but I'm looking for, that's the one. Yeah, I didn't exactly make that clear. I apologize. Digital and analog. But yeah, no, totally. Plus and minus. That's actually completely correct as well. Because <laughs> I wasn't clear enough. Um, but yeah, digital and analog. Can anybody remind me of what the difference between digital and analog is? Well, how about this? Digital, you can only send a two signals, right? Either on or off. Analog, you can send a bazillion different signals. Technically infinite, but that at some point that doesn't really stand up to practical application. No worries, Cohen. You're fine. Um, so analog can send a whole range of values from full off to full on and anything in between. Digital can only send either full off or full on. However, here's the thing. Sometimes you get stuck in a predicament. You've got something that sends out a digital signal, right? It can only send out off or on. You've got something that can read, can only read an analog signal. Now you have a problem. You want to send a range of values, but you can only send out a digital signal. How do you do it? Well, you can sort of simulate an analog signal by sending out a digital signal and flipping between on and off rapidly like just like hundreds, thousands, millions of times a second. And the way you the way you actually simulate an analog signal is by varying how long you keep it you you send an on signal versus how long you send an off signal. Think back to our graph of a digital signal. Remember it's either full on or full off. And then there are these points where they're just like vertical lines, which represent switching from on to off or vice versa. Now, that's kind of what output of a digital signal looks like. However, this digital signal is off for roughly the same amount of time that it's on, because this is a graph over time. This might be zero seconds, and this might be one second. So over the course of one second, it flips from on to off two times, and from off to on two times. It's off twice, and it's on, it looks like about three times. Point being, anyway, it spends roughly the same amount of time off that it does on. It doesn't really look like it, but I'm just estimating based on the way I drew this. What if we were to do, whoops, here's our graph again. What if we were to do something like, R? this. Looking at this, we can probably guess that it is spending a lot more time off than it is on. The low values are there a lot more often than the high values are, and when the high values are there, they're only there for a very short period of time. Conversely, we might have something that looks like this. Now it's on for a long time and off for very short periods of time. We might even have something that looks like this.
where it's on for a long period of time, off for a decent period of time, on for a short period of time, off for a decent period of time, on for a shorter period of time, and so on. Where we can vary the ratio of on to off. This is the fundamental idea behind pulse width modulation. By varying the amount of time that it is on versus when it is off, we can kind of pretend to have an analog signal. So if it's on a lot more than it's off, it's kind of like it's close to full power. If it's off a lot more than it's on, it's kind of like it's close to no power. Think back to what kind of signal a servo takes in. It's a timed electrical pulse. Basically, we send it a short pulse, we wait a certain amount of time, we send it another short pulse, we wait a certain amount of time, we send another short pulse, and it interprets that as a command to turn a certain amount. Pulse width modulation sends short electrical signals over a determined amount of time. A servo takes short electrical signals over a determined amount of time. Seems like they kind of work together pretty well, right? So that's why we have it hooked up to the three instead of the two, because we want to send a pulse width modulation, a pulse width modulated signal to a PWM signal to the servo to influence how far it turns. So anyway, that was like a, you know, 20 minute explanation on why it's hooked up to pin three. But now, you know, we've gone over PWM again and all that kind of stuff. And hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. Now let's hook up the potentiometer. The potentiometer is just an incredibly important part of this equation. I'm going to rotate the potentiometer sideways. Again, so we're on three separate um, rails. That's going to be important. Now we're going to make sure that one rail is hooked up to power and we'll make it red to signify that. So here terminal one and then the terminal on the opposite side is going to be hooked up to ground and we'll make that wire black. In fact, let's actually move this over here and we'll get rid of these curves in it to make it easier to see. Cool. Makes sense so far, right? <sighs> this middle, this middle prong, the middle terminal, this is the one that actually sends the value out to the Arduino. So let's go ahead and we'll hook that up to A0. Why A0, you might ask? Well, because we're going to be taking in an analog signal into the Arduino. So we'll change this to turquoise. No, let's change it to green. Well, we'll have a ba be back at green. So now we've got the green is the signal in circuit and the purple is the signal out circuit. So looking at this, our servo and our potentiometer are both hooked up to the power and the ground that the Arduino is sending out, the 5 volts and the GND. However, the servo is also hooked up to pin 3. We're going to be sending a value out of pin 3 into our servo. The potentiometer is also hooked up to pin A0. We're going to be sending a value from the potentiometer to pin A0. So A0 is going to be input, pin 3 is going to be output. We're taking in an analog signal and we're sending out a digital PWM signal. I'll give you guys a minute to look at the, uh, the circuit and make sure you got everything hooked up properly and then we're going to get into the coding.
Raise your hands once you're pretty sure you got this circuit hooked up. All right, we'll wait for a few more hands because we got a couple up right now. But not everybody. Not everybody. <laughs> I noticed Mateo. <laughs> Yeah, no worries. I got you. You're good. Well, we got a few other people who don't have their hands raised, so I just want to make sure we got everybody all hooked up and ready to go before we get started on the, the programming side of things. Okay, just waiting on a couple more hands, and then we will get started on the programming side. Apologize for sniffling and coughing. I may not have already said it, but yeah, I, I have a bit of a, a cold right now. So I sound like extra pathetic. <laughs> Patience. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so if I just hit start simulation here, I see I can, I can mess around with the value on the potentiometer. But nothing's happening. Of course, we got to do the circuit part of it. So let's start taking a look at that. Bam, 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 bam. Whoops. We just click all oh, the wrong things. Oh, no. Okay. I think I can bring back... I think I can bring back my circuit. 
Yeah, there we go. Be careful where you click. Okay. So, um, circuit's back. Nothing happened. Everything's fine. Uh, let's look at the coding side of things. What are the two things we need in every Arduino program? What does anybody remember? They're the backbone of all Arduino programs. You got it. Bam, we need those two things. Now keep in mind uh, that we've actually got another thing we gotta add since we're working with servos. Uh, does anybody happen to remember what that might be? Got it, Mateo. Good guess, though, uh, Cohen. Yeah, we've got a we've got to include servo dot h, and what that does is that includes all of the commands and everything like that, all the instructions we need in order to be able to get a servo up and running with our code, which is going to be kind of important because we're working with servos, right? A little bit important. I like to think so, at least. Um. Okay, so we've got our include servo.h, and now we need to declare a servo. So this is just servo, we'll call it, uh, well, we'll just call it my servo. Because I'm boring. But yes, we do need to include this as well. You're exactly right, Brendan. We need to include a servo object that we can work with, and then we're actually going to uh, we're going to create a value that will hold uh, the potentiometer information, the, the potentiometer reading. So we're going to call this um, uh, we'll call this ROTVAL rotation value. We're going to call it rotation value. I know it says rot val, but it's short for rotation value. Now, these are all of the basically very initial beginner starting things that we need in order to get this working. We've got our servo library included. We've got a servo object. And we've got a variable that is going to hold the potentiometer reading. Now, you know, in the past, I've done a lot of this stuff without actually um, including a variable for the potentiometer reading. Technically, we don't really uh, we don't really need to do that. Well, we should. We should. We're actually going to. Um, we're going to do this in order to, to 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 make things a lot easier for us a little bit later on in the code. So, what do we need to do in void setup? What's what's one thing that we've always needed to do in void setup? With all of our with all of our circuits, well, loop is a separate uh, function. What? Are, okay, so like when we've done the LED circuits and stuff like that, what have we needed to do in order to to? Well, yes, um, that's true, uh, but in order to actually tell the Arduino that we're sending values out, or reading them in, maybe. We'll always put one thing into uh, into setup. How about this? Does that look familiar? <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. So in this case, we're going to set A0 
as an input pin. We're going to be reading an input from pin analog uh, zero, A0, which is the one that's hooked up to our potentiometer. Boom, done. However, there is something else we need to attach, or something else we need to do. We need to attach my servo to three. So now, the my servo object, anytime we send it instructions, send the Arduino instructions to rotate the servo, we want to make sure that it's sending information out on pin three. Here in the example, it's pin nine, but it's also hooked up to pin nine on the Arduino. So we want to attach my servo to pin three. The reason why it's pin three is because we hooked it up to pin three, and the reason why it's specifically pin three, we hooked it up to pin three, is because pin three sends out a PWM signal. So there we go. We're done with setup. We're taking in a value. We're telling the Arduino to take in a value from pin A0, or to get ready to take in a value from pin A0, and we're telling the Arduino to get ready to send signals out, in fact, PWM signals out, on pin three. So now we need to mess around with void loop. First of all, we need to put a value into our variable. Rotation value equals analog read A0. We're taking an analog read from pin A0 and we're placing it into the variable rotation value. Pretty simple, right? Then we're going to write a value out, in fact, rotation value, to the servo. And then we're going to delay 25 milliseconds. This sort of would work, kind of not really. And there's a reason for that, which I'm going to get into in a moment. Uh, first, I'm going to check something real quick. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. Um, now, can anybody maybe guess as to what that issue might be? Just, just like hazard a guess. Whenever we've read analog values, what do we get? Not an error. Not necessarily. Everything works okay. But think about the, the, the numbers that are output. Well, the servo, the servo does take a PWM signal, um, but the, the nice thing about the servo library is it automatically converts a, an integer value uh, in degrees into a PWM signal. So it does all the math for us, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, limited numbers. Hey, you're touching on it. You got it. You're right there. You're red hot. So. Does anyone remember the value, the range of values we can get on an analog read? Yeah, it's 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 around a thousand twenty-three. When we send a value to the servo, when we write a value to the servo, oh, you're fine. Um, when we write a value to the servo, we give it a rotation in degrees, exactly, from 0 to 180. So thus, writing directly from our analog read to our servo, we tell it to rotate like we get a, we get a maximum value. We tell it to rotate to 1,023 degrees. It's going it, it, to, it's just going to rotate as far as it can, and that's the best it can do. And, uh, y you know, you might get a, like a cheap servo that's going to try and rotate further, and then you could break things, and that's all bad. So what we need to do is we need to find some way to constrain our maximum to be 180. Not only that, 
because we can do that. We can say, okay, hey, don't send it a value higher than 180. And it's going to go, okay. But the thing is, we get a value from 0 to 1,023, and we stop reading at anything higher than 180, we're going to have a very small, 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 small range, like on our, on our potentiometer. It's basically going to be from like here to here that the servo is going to rotate. And then anything beyond that, it's just going to rotate to max and stop. So what we want to do is we want to have our values basically smoothly interpolate from minimum to maximum. Uh, basically translate from minimum to maximum. So if we're at 50 degree or 50% on the potentiometer, 50 degrees, 50% uh, of the potentiometer, it should rotate 90 degrees on the servo. If we're at 75% on the potentiometer, it should rotate uh, 135 degrees. Yes, 135 degrees on the servo. Things like that, you know? So what we're going to do is we're going to use a function called map. Uh, you might notice that I didn't actually, that I kept this line blank. I didn't actually just, you know, um, go down to the next line. That was very much intentional. So here's how map works. Obviously, you have the map in the parentheses. You give it an initial variable to pull these map values from. Then you give it the minimum and the maximum that you can read that that you know your initial variable can have and then you give it a minimum and a maximum that you want to constrain those values to so here we are this is what a full map looks like oh well let's make it 179 instead of 180 179 is, is safer so map map the values of rotation value rotation value is fed into map um, with a value in it of anywhere from 0 to 123 and we want to create a ratio basically an end result of 0 to 179 so if we get a value of 512 that will kind of be like an equivalent to 90 it will map that to 90. So we're giving, we're, we're basically constraining the values to a much smaller ratio, or a, a much smaller set of values. And we're also ensuring that the, uh, that the ramp up is similar to the ramp up in values we'd get by using the potentiometer. Okay, so with that, we've actually finished our code. I'm gonna go ahead and copy paste this into the chat box. Not only that, I am going to put this into our code editor for the Arduino so that we can test this out. So replace everything that's in the code editor with our new code. Upload and run. Successfully compiled. We're now simulating it. As you can see, the servo is just kind of sitting at this value here. If I turn the potentiometer, the servo turns in the opposite direction. It's a little wonky like that. That's just because the... Um, as we turn the potentiometer more uh, clockwise, we actually get a lower value on uh, A0. And so it's sending a lower value, thus a lower rotation to the servo. But if we you know, turn the potentiometer the other direction, we're gonna, yep. And we could actually fix that with the mapping function. If we change, if we change the, uh, the values that are mapped out on it, if we swap these out, so 179, and zero. Nice. Uh, the code is actually in the chat box, uh, Hannah. So you 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 should be able to. Um... Nice. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Here we go, rotating it, rotating it, rotating it. Hey, 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 rotating it. But yeah, there you go.
And that's what you end up getting. You end up getting a servo that can be controlled by a potentiometer. Were you able to were you able to see the, the, the code, Hannah? Okay, so uh, it is 8.54, so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to do poll questions and you got questions from you guys, question and answer time, and then we'll, uh, you know, break for the weekend. Uh, so as always, I know I've said it a million times before, I'll say it a million times again. If you have any questions about anything, whether or not they're related to the class, you're more than welcome to ask them. Otherwise, once we hit question and answer time, if you don't have any questions, you're more than welcome to head out and we will see you on Monday. So without further ado, first poll question coming.